Hey everybody, Wally Renee here from the Mod Institute. I'm really excited to talk to you about how we bond zirconia. Now there's a lot of really good techniques out there and some phenomenal materials. Um, what I'm going to try to do is pull from some of the evidence in the literature and also kind of talk a little bit about what I've been doing for the past 15, 16 years or so. Now this is also something that we cover in our occlusion track. We have a Master of Digital Occlusion track. These three courses are designed to really be a comprehensive view of everything that's going on with modern occlusal concepts in the digital world. Okay, let's get to it. So how do we bond zirconia? I, I think um, a better question to ask is kind of why, right? Why, why is really the fundamental reason um, that we do things. And I think if you understand the, the why, you'll, you'll immediately understand the how. So, um, and I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, why clinically would you want to? I'm talking about why do we use the chemicals that we do? Of course, clinically, if you look at some research that's been published, low levels of evidence and um, anecdotal, but some uh, research is out there that indicates that zirconia restorations have a greater debond than conventional porcelain fused to metal or glass ceramic restorations. Uh, my buddy Nate Lawson at UAB did a um, kind of a survey and, and it showed that 50% of dentists report having uh, much higher debonds with um, zirconia. That's a little bit of an issue. It's concerning. In fact, if you look at some of the literature out there, you see anywhere from a 5 to a 15% annual debond rate. That's extremely high. Um, and so what's going on? Well, it, it turns out zirconia is extremely inert, and that's kind of why it's so biocompatible. Uh, nothing likes to stick to it, including plaque. Um, tissue loves it, and you know, it doesn't, um, it's very tissue friendly. It, it's, it's able to osseointegrate even um, for zirconia implants. But this same Benefit in those areas works against us as we try to stick something to it. And so I'm going to go ahead and give you the cheat code for those of you guys who don't really care about knowing the, the kind of why. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you. There's five, I'm sorry, four basic steps. So step one, you're going to do some type of microabrasion. I prefer aluminum oxide, 30 to 50 microns. Um... And let's just go through this real quick. So I would say it's really safe to do a 50 micro, micrometer aluminum oxide particles. You're going to sandblast for 5 to 10 seconds. And you want to do it about 2 bars of pressure, which is um, roughly about 0 0.25 MPA or 24 PSI. Okay, so you do want to control that pressure. Um, there's a lot of issues with using those kind of giant laboratory blasters. You'll get a lot of um, tetragonal to monoclinic phase transformation, um, anywhere from 30 to 300 microns into the intaglio surface of that restoration, causing an overload of the transformation toughening. Um, you also want to do this at about 10 millimeters distance from the restoration. Um, so you don't want to be right up on it and you want to be a little bit away. Um, and again, five to 10 seconds. So, I mean, these are kind of simple rules to go by 50 microns, five to 10 seconds, about two bars of pressure and about 10 millimeters away. And there is, you might be like, wow, that's very specific. Well, why, well, who cares what particle size do I use? Well, who cares about the pressure? But all these things do indeed matter. Um, and we'll go into the science a little bit in this talk, but if, if you're not into the science, you don't care, just, I guess, just take my word for it, or um, there's going to be some references attached that you could read. So that's step one. Step two is probably one of my favorite products from Ivaclar, um, one of my favorite companies. IvoClean. Why I love this is because it has a, it's, it has a pH of 13. That is much needed um, for the MDP to be able to bond um, 
effectively to the zirconia. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it also is a cleaning agent that will remove phosphates um, from the zirconia after trying. Okay, so that's step two after you micro braid. Of course, step one would be try the restoration and make sure it fits, right? <clears throat> so step three would be a chemical primer. Um, Curare is, is very well known for their MDP. Ivacolor has Monobond Plus, which has a uh, MDP in it as well. I'm going to focus on Curare. I have, uh, I'm mixing companies here and, you know, that's just sometimes what you do. Um, so 10 MDP, okay, that is going to form ionic and polar bonds with the zirconia. So you'll get a chemical interaction um, in addition to the micromechanical from the sandblasting here at step one. And then lastly, and oftentimes not well understood um, and, and slightly controversial is the step four here, is this um, alloy primer from Karari. And um, interestingly enough, this is something that's not very well um, known out there. But the, the chemical here, this has MDP as well, but it also has this kind of super molecule um, VBATDT, this vinyl benzyl amino propyl triazine diethone group. We'll talk about that later. And so it has the 10 methacryl oxydecyl dihydrogen phosphate and the vinyl benzyl amino propyl triazine diethone. These two beauties um, work synergistically to increase um, bond longevity, okay? Interestingly, if you look at what's really being active here, it's this um, thiol group. So it has a, this has a two, two sulfurs in it. And Ivoclar has with their monobond plus, um, so monobond plus can take the place, if you guys are wondering, um, you could kind of use it instead of these two things here. You could just replace that with Monobond Plus. But um, I'm going to talk mainly about the combination of doing these four steps here. And we'll go into that um, a little bit here. So a little bit about me before we start talking about this stuff. Um, I spent 15 years as an academician, um, and the first 10 years of my career I spent uh, doing adhesive, um, basically adhesive research. And I got to work with some greats, such as uh, Dr. Pashley um, out of um, Georgia and Camila Sabatini out of Buffalo, and some other fantastic people, and um, learned a lot about adhesive dentistry, even have a few patents um, for some anti-collagenolytic uh, dental materials. Um, but enough about me. Let, let's, let's start talking a little bit about kind of the dentistry that I like to do, and then we'll talk about why bonding is so important for me and for others. Number one is I like to focus on conservative adhesive ceramics, um, whether they're partial coverage or full coverage, it doesn't matter. Um, I like to do these types of preparations because it's kind of um, a passion of mine, and, and I'm not saying that just because <clears throat> there's wrong ways and right ways to do dentistry. This is just kind of what I like to do. Um, so these types of conservative little onlay restorations have been the bread and butter of my practice um, for the greater part of 15 years now, including some conservative adhesive overlays and things like that. You might be saying that's great, but these don't look like zirconia. In fact, they're not. I typically gravitate towards lithium disilicate or, or even 3D printed polymers for these types of restorations. But that doesn't mean there's not a, a place for zirconia for me in my practice. Um, here's, a, here's a giant long span bridge. Sweetest lady in the world has a knife edge ridge here, refuses any type of split ridge augmentation, any type of grafting there. And so we really, and she refuses uh, removables. And so we have this giant long span here um, normally, I would say this is a PFM um, indication here for sure, just from a predictability standpoint. Um, but in my practice, um, I tend to have patients that will refuse metal despite the 
metal restoration here um, for a number of reasons, primarily aesthetics, um, but also there's just this kind of uh, mis um, information out there that metal is toxic and it's going to, you know, kill everybody, even noble alloys. So I don't tend to argue with patients. I try to find solutions of how to do all ceramics, um, such as zirconias, predictably in these scenarios. And so uh, here you can see we have a giant long span bridge. Um, I wouldn't, you know, build your practice out of stuff like this, but um, this is the zirconia, monolithic zirconia restoration delivered here. Um, and we could see it's in, in perfect occlusion. Um, this is a false contact here on that non-functional incline. Um, but, you know, how, how do we get this to be predictable? Because normally what happens if you look at the literature, you, you tend to get a debond with zirconia of the distal most abutment uh, retainer tooth here, and that then causes uh, micro leakage, recurrent decay, and failure. And so, typically, the doc's having to cut things off and redo it. Um, so, how can we predictably bond um, this restoration in place here and on these two small little retainer teeth? And that's where it be, starts to become really important for these complicated cases, even uh, implant cases where you're bonding to titanium, uh, multi unit abutment caps, and uh, things like that. I also oftentimes will do conservative zirconia um, inlay retain prosthetics here, also adhesion bridges in the anterior. And so here you can see we have a little wing right here, a um, little ring wing right here. This is an inlay retained uh, 3Y zirconia for 3 um, molar yttria oxide stabilized zirconia. And this is um, something that you definitely need to know how to bond to be able to, to do this. And then most recently, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, um, but I have hundreds of zirconia veneers. Uh, <laughs> um, crazy, right? Um, some of you guys are going to say, why on earth would you do zirconia veneers? And I'm not here to convince you that it's a good thing, nor would I base your practice on it if I were you. But uh, for me, there's a number of reason, uh, reasons. One is um, the beautiful um, multi-layer pucks that you could get now um, that go from 3Y to 5Y or 4Y to 5Y or 4Y um, to 3Y kind of uh, with these translucency gradations built in. Also the chroma is built in as well. There's not many lithium silicate pucks that you could buy, period, nor are there hardly any that you could get that are um, multi-layered. Two is puck milling. Um, I switched to puck milling a few years ago, never looked back. I could nest all 10 veneers and go home and come back and have them all milled out, ready to go. I love that zirconia shrinks 20%. It is like a shrinky dink. In other words, when I'm putting anatomy in, um, fine little imbrication lines like here, if you see here, these little lines um, here, it's, it's easy to do because you, you do it um, and then you look at it and you're like, this is terrible. And then it shrinks in the oven 20% and then it comes out and you're like, wow, I could never have cut that by hand. So I like the surface texture that I'm able to get and that's more of a me problem. Um, and I really do like that I can mill it feather margins um, and don't have to worry about chipping. I like the way it finishes. And uh, finally, I like that I could mask um, dark, you know, I could go with a 3Y um, at 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeters thick, and that hides pretty much anything. Um, so in other words, with glass ceramics, I found myself having to reduce a lot more to hide dark tooth structure. With uh, zirconia, I could be more conservative, and that's kind of my main focus in, in my practice is how, being conservative. Okay, so... Um, Let's just get into it. Let's go to step one here with the aluminum oxide. And we kind of touched on this uh, earlier, but um, there's a lot of uh, studies out there. And we'll go through some of them, but not all of them. Um, there's tribochemical um, kind of silica particles that you could like, for example, cojet sand that you could use in place of aluminum oxide. And what cojet is, it's um, got silica nanoparticles that when you blast the crown surface, let's say this is the crown surface and you bombard it with particles, 
What you're left with then um, afterwards is a surface that is very irregular, but also has little silica nanoparticles stuck in it. Um, and what's nice about that, um, we have predictable bonding to these types of glass um, silica particles. And so you could use conventional silanes and things like that. I am not gonna head down that route tonight um, with you guys. I'm more gonna focus on um, MDP type chemistries. And so for that, I like aluminum oxide. Um, and again, um, if you look, um, different studies, but influencing of particle size and different pressures on the bond durability, and also, more importantly, the residual stress. So the, what are you doing to the zirconia surface? Because we all know um, zirconia is sensitive to transformation of the tetragonal phase to the monoclinic, which causes a 3 to 4% increase in volume at the site of the sandblast, which... Um, can be good to a certain extent that you're going to slightly toughen that surface. Um, but then if you overwhelm that system, you start to go downhill very fast, um, where you're going to impart internal tensile stresses, micro fractures that will show up um, with a fractured restoration. This is kind of a lot of the times when you get a restoration back from the lab and it looks perfect and then you like you seed it and it cracks. Um, typically, they were kind of a little bit uh, cowboy with the uh, particle abrasion, probably, or some type of internal adjustments, and they didn't heal it in the oven. So, I mean, if you look at 50 micron as plenty um, to be able to achieve a roughened surface, this is done with 50 micron aluminum oxide here. And you can see the normal surface is just too smooth. Think ice skating rink. Um, and what you're doing more than roughening, you're, you're, you're doing a few things when you sandblast. One is, most importantly, is you're increasing the surface energy. And what that does is increase wettability. So that's going to increase um, how a hydrophobic, think resin cement, is able to uh, adhere. Um, and it's also going to decrease the contact angle, which is like essentially if you put a, um, if this is your surface and you drop um, a bead of material, a very um, smooth surface that has um, low free energy is going to cause a, a droplet of resin to just kind of beat up on the surface it doesn't want to wet where when you increase the free energy what's going to happen is actually that droplet's going to spread out like this um, so that contact angle is going to decrease it's going to soak into that surface so all those things are super important so it's not just creating a rough surface um, and so here we could see this is a different study um, this is the aluminum oxide and this is actually the cojet sand it doesn't do quite as good of a job at roughening so this this aluminum oxide is a better uh, material for roughening. Now, if you look at the particle size, um, what you'll find is uh, 100 microns plus, you start to get extreme damage to the intaglio surface of the zirconia with the giant phase transformation occurring, which will ultimately dramatically decrease your mechanical properties. Um, bond strengths will be about the same. So here we could see, this is a, um, a different study as well, that if you do nothing to the zirconia, this is just untreated, First of all, look how, how this gap has formed here. This is composite here. Let me change my color. This is um, it's composite cement, right? You can see the glass filler particles in the cement here. Um, this is the organic um, matrix here. And this is the inorganic filler. And this is the zirconia here. And this giant gap formed, why? It's not really a wettable surface. It has a low energy. Um, it's really hard to get um, intimate adaptation. When you microbraid, and here this was 50 microns at two bar for five seconds, which is a really good um, minimum here in the five seconds. This is actually a really good gentle um, treatment of zirconia here. But you could see the intimate adaptation of the composite here to the zirconia wall right there. Um, big difference between those two, and that all has to do with wettability of the surface. Again, so um, in summary, we're going to do 30 to 50 micron aluminum oxide 
and we're gonna do it at two bars of pressure, which is like, I don't know, 0 0.25 MPA or about 24 PSI. We're gonna do it for about 10 seconds um, at about 10 millimeter distance. Okay, just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind here, a little step one here. Okay, so step two, my favorite step, uh, mostly because I'm so happy that we have a product like this that came out because before this, we had a lot of issues of how to clean the zirconia after trying. But this step two, and again, pH of 13, that's important to understand because, let's see, where is it? Here it is. This study here, the effect of pH um, on the con reactive reactivity of MDP primers showed that um, when you have an alkaline pH, much, much better bond. Um, so again, in addition to the pH, it also is a decontamination of, you know, saliva has a lot of phospholipids. If you think back to cellular biology, your phospholipid bilayer, um, and what that does, and multiple studies show that this is um, happening, is that phosphates in the saliva, organophosphates, will actually form these ionic um, interactions and covalent interactions with the zirconia here. And what these actually do is they actually block the surface of the zirconia so that when you go back with your MDP, um, and you try to attach your MDP. Whoa, change that here. So your MDP here is not going to be inter able to interact at all with your zirconia. And so basically, you just put expensive liquid on the restoration for absolutely no reason. So you have to um, strip the zirconia from the oral phosphates. And there's there's few really good studies that review um, IvoClean and, and, and how it works. Okay, so once the surface has been free and cleaned, it's been roughened and then cleaned, um, so step three, and this is the well-known step, I don't have to go really into this um, too much, but step three is a MDP-containing primer. Um, and I don't have to go into the literature here. I mean, I think I've read probably 20 studies that show that MDP in some form has a positive effect on um, bond strength and longevity after aging. And if you look at the research, there's even some clinical studies that look at cantilevered um, resin bonded zirconia fixed partial dentures, both at five year and 10 year. And the, the results are 95 plus success rate, even at that 10 year mark. Um, and so what's going on here, I mean, if you guys want to understand the chemistry of what's going on, um, basically, uh, MDP, um, and this is, you know, I think it's important to kind of know um, what's going on here. So you have this vinyl group, and the vinyl group is essentially um, what is going to do free radical polymerization um, with any resin, this group right here. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to just draw out really quick. Um, if I can remember. Uh, this is the 10 part here. It has 10 carbons here. And then we have an oxygen, kind of an organophosphate here. Um, And it's actually this section that is able to um, interact with the zirconia. And this section here that is able to do free radical polymerization, um, whether it's dual cured or auto cured um, through like uh, camphorquinone or ivoserin or some other free radical initiator. This is what's going to cause your your chain growth with your um, resin cement. 
So it doesn't matter, you don't need MDP in the actual cement to be able to polymerize with this, because this will form with any resin cement. But this here is what we're gonna actually form these interactions with zirconia oxide. So zirconia is a dioxide, um, like this. The surface um, is basically an oxide, oops. And what you're gonna be able to do is you're gonna form interactions here between these groups and these oxygens and hydrogens here on the zirconia, okay? It's a relatively kind of weak um, ionic interaction. Um, and there's multiple different ways that you form these interactions um, where you're interacting between the zirconia here and the oxygen here. So you're gonna pop that hydrogen back um, and form a bond here that hydrogen's um, going to be removed. And this is why you want an alkaline pH. You don't want an acidic pH because if you have an acidic pH, these hydrogens here are not gonna be able to be ripped off and interact this oxygen uh, free species here with a negative charge to the zirconia plus four or whatever is down there. So in other words, these ionic interactions need an alkaline pH. Also, uh, this phosphate group, <laughs> if you think back, I know some of you guys like use blue phosphoric acid etch on your zirconia to clean it. That's the worst idea ever um, because your phosphoric groups are just gonna bond right here, prevent any interaction at all. You can't scrub them off um, to your MDP primer. Again, we, I'm not gonna go too much into this chemistry because it's well documented. Um, but this is step one. You're gonna get these ionic interactions um, and polar interactions with zirconia dioxide there. Um, so step, and that explains the alkaline pH there because these hydrogens need to interact. Step four, okay, step four is alloy primer. Now, alloy primer has MDP, and it also is, and this is something that's not very well known, um, it, it has uh, my favorite molecule in dentistry, BBATDT. I think this doesn't get enough love. Everybody's all about MDP, whatever, super good, because MDP kind of does everything well. Um, it bonds to covalent bonds to hydroxyapatite, and it's phenomenal. But VBATDT is magic in that it bonds to things that nothing else wants to bond to, such as precious metal, gold. Also bonds to like cobalt chrome. So like if you have an RPD clasp and you want to bond composite to it or something to hide it, make it tooth colored. Um, but it synergistically works with MDP to bond to zirconia. And what's really fascinating is that we have data before anybody else even knew anything that was going on, 2009, that shows this. Um, we have data before that, 2008, um, with Lindergren, phenomenal study. Um, this is, in 2008, I actually repeated this study in 2010, um, did not publish it, but recapitulated re this study and found the same exact thing um, with alloy primer. And so in these studies, what they're finding is that the metal primer, the alloy primer, um, bond strength was not affected after aging. And so the Achilles of kind of zirconia bonding is that you'll get 20s or 30s but then after um, aging megapascals of bond strength, after aging, it goes down to like four. It's, I can't even write it so low. It goes down to like five or below. And that's sad. Um, but when you, when you combine VBATDT with this, it seems to kind of synergistically uphold the integrity of the bond over time. And, and there's some theory around what's going on here. 
This was reconfirmed in 2018 as well, um, pulling, there's not a lot of studies on this. There's probably a thousand studies on MDP and zirconia. Um, so it, let's, let's just look a little bit on this vinyl benzyl aminopropyl triazine diethone. Let's, let's spell it out because vinyl, again, another vinyl group here, right? This is, uh, and then it has a benzyl group. If you remember, jeepers creepers, something's wrong with my... If you remember from chemistry, uh, a benzyl group is that benzene ring, and you have kind of this, like that. So that's your vinyl benzyl. Then it has this aminopropyl group. Um, let's see here. Go down, this is the amino, and this is the propyl group. Um, I think it's, if I remember, propyl, it's like a propyl alcohol kind of propyl group there. And the magic is this triazine diethone ring. Um, this, this is the coolest chemistry that nobody has ever heard of um, with these two sulfurs. Let me come down as an NH here. Um, here we have another nitrogen group. <clears throat> Got two salt. Okay. A Sl little bit sloppy, but you guys get the point. It's this group here that makes magic happen. These sulfurs. And there's some studies that show that sulfur, especially a disulfide or diethone group, can form, because, you know, zirconia dioxide, um, zirconia likes two oxygens, one there, one there. But there's some evidence that supports that zirconia can actually f form a covalent bond with sulfur. And a covalent bond is much stronger than an ionic bond, much stronger than a polar bond. And typically, I mean, what happens if, if it's going to do this? Let me see if I could erase this real quick. And it's kind of cool. All that's going to happen is you're going to form a bond here pop those electrons there. And same thing on the other side. Um, form a covalent bond there. Pop those electrodes over there. And so what happens is you form basically a, a ring in this surface here where you're going to um, come down here and you're going to come down here. You're going to pop off this H here. Okay, so now you have double bonds here, on the nitrogens. And this is a super stable structure. Okay, so this, this becomes potentially uh, a synergistic bond uh, where these oxygens here are able to interact more with MDP and the zirconia actually itself might interact with the sulfur. And again, there's not a lot of studies out there on this of uh, the exact mechanism but what we do know is you know based off of evidence in the literature is that the, these do actually work to increase the integrity of the bond strength so that's why i use it at step four um alloy primer so step three i use ceramic primer so these kind of four steps is what i've been doing for everything for the past i don't know jeepers forever and um, I've been very successful with bonding zirconia in this way. Um, I hope this helps explain um, kind of how I do it and, and what is going on. Um, I am not, you know, I did, I do have an organic chemistry background, but I am not a, in any means a, a true chemist. So some of you guys who are smarter than me might understand this stuff better, but understanding what I'm doing helps me as I'm doing it, um, at least understanding it kind of superficially like I do. So hopefully this kind of helps you understand why you're putting these things on the teeth and um, 
on your on your zirconia restorations and not just kind of mindlessly doing it. Anyway, guys, I really do enjoy um, doing these types of things. If you want, uh, we could go into um, how to bond glass ceramics and also 3D printed resins because um, they're all very different. Um, just let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in. Have a good night.